Well, hello. I am Richie Ray. The pleasure will be all yours. Hey, everybody, this is Ken Ocham at Texas Nightlife and also one of the proud owners of Songcast.net. And I just wanted to say hi to Lynn Amsterdam. How you doing, Lynn, out there on your show? I hope everything's going great for you. Say hi to all you, all the fans out there. Lynn's shows just rock. So get her done, Lynn. Right. <laughs> DJ from Canada, now heard on the Len Amsterdam Digital Television Radio Network, and that would be worldwide. This is the debut edition of Whitby Shores Live. I would really like to introduce our next uh, guest uh, for you, uh, Sleepy Bomb, all the way from New Orleans, Louisiana, United States of America. And uh, Sleepy is one of our more popular members at Whitby Shores, and I'm going get to him, get him to tell you a great story about the day that uh, he met Stuart Copeland of the police. How you doing, brother? Oh, glad to be here, Lynn. Oh, the, uh, the police story. Well, uh, it was a night in uh, 1978, early 78, I believe, and it was uh, at a bar called Low Man Rivers. And we were opening for the police, and they were on their uh, first tour of America. And uh, we were in the backstage in between sound checks, and the uh, green room was very, very small. So we were all kind of packed in there. And uh, me and my cousin we were running through this song that we just wrote it. And Stuart just was enthralled and wanted to do all the chords. And he, w he sat there and just enjoyed himself, hanging around with the boys from New Orleans. He just loved the city. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Were any of the, uh, were any of the police uh, songs charting at the time, or were they being played on the radio, or were they total unknowns at uh, this time? Oh, maybe, maybe uh, they had uh, one single out, I think. The first album had just come out, and I know that it, Roxanne had not broken yet, so this was really early on. They had uh, just started the East Coast leg of the tour. So, yeah, they were pretty much unknowns. We just loved them because they were from England. You know, I'm Anglophile, so anything with a British accent usually swings my head. Uh, that's, uh, that's very cool. Uh, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll be talking a lot to Sleepy Bomb, but uh, the reason we're really here tonight is to uh, showcase uh, Sleepy Bomb. And uh, what do you got, uh, what are you going to spin for our members tonight? Well, let me see. Uh, we got the, uh, the the new hit song on Whitby Shores with, uh, by the Metri Rex called uh, Blue Sky Drive. And um, once the technology gets better, I'm sure we'll have the accompanying video. But for now, you'll have to go to the site to see it. And um, I might throw in something uh, Whitby has not heard before. Very, very cool. Okay, folks, here we go. The Metri Rex, Blue Sky Drive. Now heard on Whippy Shores Television Radio. All right, here we go.
Now, do you recall uh, that actual gig? Uh, how many people were uh, in the bar? And uh, do you recall if uh, do you recall any of the police songs that might have been played that night? I remember um, that there, there was must have been maybe two, three hundred people out of um, out of maybe the six that it holds, five or six that Old Man Rivers used to hold. Um, we had a really big, big punk new wave crowd down here everybody was you know I mean it's New Orleans it's pretty this place is bohemian anyways another uh, punk icon uh, that I'd like to talk about is uh, uh, the Ramones uh, I understand it was the uh, your previous uh, incarnation the Metri Dukes that uh, played with uh, uh, the boys yeah we were one step out of New Orleans playing original rock and roll toting the upright piano around with us and um, we opened for uh, the Talking Heads at the warehouse. Uh, we opened for the Robert Gordon and Link Ray at Old Main Rivers and the Ramones show was another one of these punk blowouts where every punk within you know a thousand mile radius was there and uh, we opened for them and uh, that was a pretty funny sight in the back of the, uh, the room too because Joey is so dang big and he's back there doing calisthenics and he's knocking things down off the walls, and he's jumping around trying to get loose for the gig. And yeah, those are some those are some heady times, I man. We played uh, we played about 285 days out of the year for about four years straight. Now you're doing some really good name dropping here, and uh, you got my interest peaked. Uh, you mentioned Link Ray, like uh, uh, I've been a big fan of a uh, Link. Uh, please elaborate a little bit about. Uh, you're meeting uh, that great guitarist. Well, we were all fans. We, we were like fans of just rock and roll in general. And as a matter of fact, we were covering Rumble, which was his, uh, his 50 instrumental hit. He was touring with Robert Gordon, and uh, Robert Gordon was totally unique. There was nobody like him at the time. And he came to New Orleans, and most of his stuff was word of mouth, and just whatever little ad putting on that we'd do, running around late at night and tagging telephone poles with flyers. And uh, but he pulled a nice crowd, and Link it was just man, he was Mr. Cool. It looked like he just walked off of a of a Harley with his his guitar slung around his back, man, like a gunslinger coming into town. It was really cool seeing him play. Now, being a big fan of Link, uh, did he cover any any of his material? I remember doing Rumble uh, for sure, and I'm not sure he might have done one or two. That was uh, you know 30 years ago, so. Uh, I'm, I don't even remember what the heck we played, um, but it, it's just, I remember him, him and, and they just looked so cool. They looked like they just stepped out of a, of a deli in the 50s, you know what I mean, with the greased hair. They just looked so... Uh, yeah, I, I got you, the, the fawns. Yeah, I seen Robert Gordon in Vancouver about 1990, and he was playing with Chris Spedding, and uh, uh, that was uh, part of his look. He had the leopard skin uh, jacket and like the slick back hair. Uh, that was that was a part of the show. But anyways, uh, we're running short on time, and it is time uh, to pause for the uh, Sleepy Bomb cause. So let's end it all with a Sleepy Bomb track. And Mike, if I can get you to introduce it for Whippy Shores Television and Radio. Thanks a lot, buddy. It was good talking to you. All right, Len. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, I enjoy talking to you, and I uh, love uh, Whippy Shores. And just for the heck of it, here's a uh, police sound-alike knockoff called... Um here comes the scary part.
Hey Canada, this is LSTL Music, and you're listening to the Len Amsterdam Radio Show. Brett Service, Len Amsterdam, station ID, take one. Len Amsterdam Radio. That uh, was really good, uh, Brett. Uh, can you try that again? Uh, maybe a little bit more uh, excitement in your voice. Len Amsterdam Radio. Oh, you've taken it to a whole new level. Uh, the, the only problem is I, I think you're speaking uh, too quickly. Uh, perhaps you could slow it down. Advances in cosmetic treatments for facial rejuvenation have come a long way in the last decade. People no longer have to expose themselves to expensive and possible dangerous procedures to look better. For many years, there has not been inexpensive alternatives to the surgical facelift. The Panji non-surgical facelift involves no downtime, allowing you to look 10 to 15 years younger without any surgery at all. Electrical stimulation is employed to exercise, strengthen, and tone those muscles of the face that become weak over time. The Panji Lift rejuvenates the superficial skin. Over time, this first layer of skin can become thin, shallow, and rough textured. The Panji Lift uses ultrasonic energy to remove the outer dead layers of skin to smooth the surface. Collagen breaks down, causing wrinkles as we age in the deep layer of the skin. The Panji Lift uses ultrasound and electronic impulses to stimulate and increase the collagen content of the skin, which in turn will diminish pore size, reduce pigmentation, soften wrinkles, and remove spider veins. The electrical stimulation causes uh, facial muscles to contract and tighten. Consider it like exercise and toning for your face. Len Amsterdam Show, broadcasting from Canada. Hi, this is Tim Brummett, singer-songwriter from Spokane, Washington, keeping them simple and singing them pretty. And you're listening to the Len Amsterdam Show. <laughs> okay, we've got uh, Tom Anders, uh, Canadian poet, in with us today. Uh, Tom, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I've been writing poetry for the last six years full-time. My first full-length book of poetry has just come out called A Different Shred of Skin. Had a little bit of difficulty finding a publisher in Canada for it, so this one was actually published out of Detroit. We had it printed up here in Canada. I, I sold, um, many American publishers can butcher the best of books down in the States, so I said to the American publisher, maybe if I could get a quote from our best printing house in Toronto. Um, and when I came back with the price, <laughs> He said, is that in American dollars? And I said, no, that's in Canadian dollars. And so we brought business up this side of the border instead of always going south of the border. Now, being a Canadian, why is it you have to even go to the States to, to find a publisher? It's so difficult being an artist in Canada. It seems you don't get any recognition until um, you're accepted either in Europe or in the United States. I'm not in Paris. Here the pigeons are friendly. Grass still grows. Cars can park for free. One bank serves the town and a cafe is just open, leaving many citizens grumbling. The roads are paved, not cobbled. Gas is cheap at Rob's Garage and the liquor store is doors away from that bank. There's a seasonal pizza house that serves the community. No subways to speak of. Art Nouveau is foreign, as toll painting is found in niche. The Legion won't allow turbans, so I don't go to the Legion. Gossip is entertainment and the post office doubles for a central station of blessed skewed information. You know, it's tough to say, but I'm kind of glad I'm not in Paris. I'm T. Anders Carson, Canadian poet, and you're tuned in to Pepper Scott.
The Adventures of Dolly Pepper and the Evil Richie Ray. Story and script by Yvonne Bertrand. Production by Len Amsterdam and Country Rose. Green Hills, USA is a small, quiet town. Dolly Pepper parks her car in the same space she has been parking every day, Monday through Friday, for the past 10 years. As she walks into the Green Hills Bank, she wonders, could life be any more boring than this? Dolly is unaware that her life is soon to change, and the evil she is soon to meet. Good morning, Dolly. Good morning, Blanche. Can you bring those loan applications we were working on Friday? We have a very busy day ahead of us. <laughs> they are already on your desk. Would you like some coffee? Thank you, Blanche. That would be nice. Dolly and Blanche are working at her desk when Dolly hears an all too familiar voice. Well, hello. I am Richie Ray. You'll be pleased to be in my uh, accompaniment. Dolly, who is that man? You don't even want to know, Blanche. And whatever you do, stay away from him. He's bad news. Well, hello. 
I am Richie Ray. The pleasure will be all yours. Hello, Richie. What brings you back in town? Well, Dolly, I have done so well in the used car business. I decided to retire and move back to my old hometown. I'm here to see about getting a loan to build a shelter for all the poor stray dogs and cats who have no home. I'm sorry, Richie, but I'm afraid we can't approve a loan for you. You have a shady past here in Green Hills. You were always very dishonest at school and cheated to get into college, which I heard you were expelled from. That is not fair to judge my character by my past. I'm sorry, Richie, but I won't approve a loan for you. Leopards don't change their spots. Well, if that's your uh, final answer, Ellie Mae... Bells, get in here! Your loan officer won't approve my loan. What seems to be the problem here? Shame on you, Dolly Pepper! Give this good man the respect he deserves! Thank you, Mr. Bells. It was good doing business with you. Well, Dolly, looks like I got the loan. Do stop by and visit my shelter when it's finished. You might find a nice dog to keep you company. It must get lonely at times for a woman in her 30s who can't find a husband. You were Miss Icebox at school with your nose in the books. Keep your nose out of my business, Dolly, or you will regret the day you met Richie Ray. See you later, Hayseed. She turns around and walks over the bank. Two months, months later, we are... Dolly, look. There is a picture of Richie Ray in the paper. He's standing in front of the shelter he built. There's a write-up about all the strays he has rescued. Dolly looks at the picture of Richie Ray and a chill goes through her. Richie Ray has gone over the town with his good deeds. Dolly, have you heard? The mayor's wife's white poodle was stolen last night. Who would do a thing like that? Dolly knew who was capable of doing a thing like that. She shakes her head and says, I need your help, Blanche. We are going to get into the shelter and take a look around. I don't trust Richie Ray. I think he is a dog napper. That night, Dolly drives out to the shelter with reluctant Blanche by her side. What are we going to do, Dolly? You wait here. I will climb a fence and let you in. I can't climb a fence. I'm scared. What if we get caught? Grow up, Blanche, and stop whining. The dogs are all asleep, and Dolly, using a flashlight, finds Richie's office. She finds nothing. She looks for a trapdoor, but there is no basement. She checks all the cages, but there are no dogs here, but for a few strays. Dolly, I hope your suspicions about Richie Ray are gone. He's not the dog napper. He seems very nice. Oh, my dear, naive friend. We are going to that shelter every night until we catch Richie Ray in the act. Oh, dear. You are possessed with this man. The next night, a car with its lights out. Parts by some trees close to the shelter. I will take the first watch. You get some sleep. I'm scared. It's dark out here. Go to sleep, Blanche. For two weeks... Dolly plays her waiting game, and just when she is about to give up... Blanche! Wake up! Richie Ray's truck has started. He can't see us here. We'll follow him. They follow the truck, but keep a safe distance. The truck heads out on the highway, with Dolly behind. I'm scared. Hush, Blanche! I'm scared, too. What happened, Dolly? Oh, gosh, my back tire just blew out. We lost him. Dolly calls out for help, and soon they are back on the highway. How about some coffee, Blanche? <sighs> I want to go home. Shut up, Blanche! There is no sign of Richie's truck in the parking lot. He had lost them. Dolly and Blanche go inside. Dolly looks around, and she and Blanche slide into a booth. Well, you girls aren't keeping banker's hours tonight. What brings y'all way out here? Y'all slumming? If you're looking for a man, there ain't much to pick from tonight. Bring us two coffees to go, Red. Can we go home now? Ah, oh, yes, Blanche. Outside, they are about to leave when Dolly sees an old house that sits behind the truck stop. Dolly drives around to take a look. Blanche, wait here. I'm coming with you. The door of the old house is not locked, and the girls go inside. It is very dark. Stay close to me, Blanche. Dolly uses her flashlight on her keys to find her way around. Room to room, they go. They're about to leave. When Dolly, Dolly, hears a whimpering. Dolly follows the sound. It seems to be coming from under the house. She finds a door, and it opens to the stairs. The girls make their way down the creaky stairs. The whimpering grows louder. 
Dolly makes her way to the sound, and by the light of her tiny flashlight, she sees the puppies. And all the kidnapped dogs who are muzzled and cannot bark. They are not alone in the house. Let's get out of here. Be quiet, Blanche. Someone is here. I think they're gone. Phew! They didn't see the car, or they would be searching for us. They see Richie Ray's truck as it leaves the house. Come on, let's get out of here. Let's follow them. Run, Blanche! We have to stop them! As she follows the truck, she has to stop him before he reaches the highway. She speeds up and passes Richie's truck and turns in front of him, blocking him. The truck skids to a stop and Dolly, Dolly jumps out to confront Richie Ray. Blanche, call the sheriff. Dolly is shaking as she waits for Richie to get out. The door opens and Dolly holds her breath. What if he had a gun? She hadn't thought of that. A figure emerges from the truck, but it's not Richie. It's Tommy, the dishwasher, at the truck stop. The sheriff's car careens into the parking lot with lights flashing. Get your hands up! All of you! Don't you, Sheriff! You're under arrest, Tommy! For what? For stealing the truck, you moron! But, Sheriff, I ain't stolen nothing. Stolen... Nothing. Miss Red gave me the keys. Sheriff! Sheriff! The kidnapped dogs are in the back of Richie Ray's truck. Richie Ray is the dog napper. Shut up, Dolly! I'll be the judge of that! No, Sheriff. It is Richie Ray who is the dog napper. Dolly! Richie Ray called me about 30 minutes ago and reported his truck stolen. If you don't shut up and let me do my job, I'll lock you up. I'm going inside. All of you, stay where you are. The jig is up, Red. Well, hello there, Sheriff. What brings you way out here tonight? And you're under the arrest for a dog! Napping! What? I ain't dog nap no dogs. I was just doing Richie a favor letting him keep some of his strays out here. We just happened to be looking for that truck when we got a call. Richie called us out to the shelter to report his truck missing. You... And your dishwasher are under arrest. He told me he was sick and I could take them to Braxton to a vet over there. I was busy, so I asked Tommy to take them. Tell it to the judge! We were framed. We are innocent. The dogs Dolly and Blanche found were straight. Dolly and Blanche didn't know this. Dolly thought they were dog napped dogs. It was dark in the house. Richie had fooled her along with the others. The pooches that were dog napped were being well cared for by Richie's old pal, who is a veterinarian. He keeps the stolen poochies at his place. They're going to sell them at a pet store, which the vet owns under an assumed name. The vet takes care of the stolen dogs for Richie. They are in cahoots. And Richie was using Red as the fall gal. She didn't know it. Love is blind. You are arrest for dog napping! Dog napping! Oh, well, Dolly, you can go home now. Poor Tommy just happens to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. The sheriff is also left with egg on his face when he is confronted by the angry owners who have come to pick up their pets and are mad as hell at Red. He vows to keep her behind bars until she tells him where the stolen dogs are. Meanwhile, Richie can sell all his stolen animals and make a nice profit and move on to the next scheme. And continue to be a model and loved citizen of Green Hills. Or so he thinks. Can we please go home now, Dolly? Well, at least the dogs are safe. I will prove what I know is true, and your evil will be brought to light some day, Richie Ray. The next day, Dolly drives to the shelter and confronts Richie. Several weeks pass by, Dolly is at her desk working when she discovers a foreclosure notice on her desk with the name Richie Ray. She picks up her purse and tells Blanche she has an errand to run. Dolly drives to the shelter. Richie, I foreclosed on your loan for lack of payment. The bank now owns your shelter and I have found someone honest to run it. You win this time, Dolly. But you haven't beaten Richie Ray. <coughs> you will never win. I will be back. <laughs> Ha! Ha! I am Richie Ray. Goodbye and good riddance.
Wonder